Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be here today. This is my first time on this campus here, and it's, it's really impressive. And it's, I got to spend a few t minutes looking at the annual report, and I just was amazed at all that, all that happens here, all that's, that, that the school supports. And um, so I'm very honored to be here, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow's panel as well. I know a number of the other panelists, and so I'm kind of excited. I haven't seen some of them in a while. Um, so hopefully some of you can come back, can come back and be with us here tomorrow. So what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about the Macaw Cultural and Research Center and the collaborations and the community-driven initiatives and our, our successes really is what I'll highlight today. Tomorrow we we're forced to answer questions about what's working and what's not working. So I won't go through the what's not working part today. You have to come back tomorrow for that. But <laughs> today I'll explain to you how, how everything, the things that work well. And so at the... Um, I'll just ask you to use your imaginations for this first part. I'll describe where, where I'm coming from and what, what it's like in the environment um, from where I come. But at the end, I'll show you some slides. So for those of you who haven't been there, you can, you can get, a, get an image, a uh, visual image of what it's like. We have folks who are just here, just out at our reservation in January. And then again, it's also nice to see other people here, Bruce and Marla, other folks who I haven't, who I haven't seen recently. I guess I've seen Marla very recently. But it is, it's really great to be here in Santa Fe. So I'm going to describe to you a little bit about the Macaw um, history and Macaw people. So we call ourselves the Quidditch Ta'at, or the people who live by the rocks and seagulls, really the people of Cape Flattery. So we are situated um, right at the very northwest tip of Washington State, as far west as you can go. We're right on the, um, right on the Pacific Ocean with our, north, our northern border looking up towards um, Vancouver Island in, um, across the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So we're very, very much on the tip there. Um, we're about 150 miles um, northwest of Seattle, so that might not sound very far, but it takes at least four hours, if not five hours, to get there. Um, and we're about an hour and a half from another uh, a town of size, Port Angeles. We've been really thriving on this land and on this water at the northwest tip of Washington State for countless generations actually taking most of our resources from the ocean. The land is very um, rich as well with lots of mammals, large mammals, but for whatever reason, Macaw people have always really had a preference to take, um, take advantage of what the ocean supplies. Um, so whales, seals, and fish traditionally have made up the bulk of our diet, um, and they still continue to play a real important role. Most Macaw people eat fish and shellfish throughout the year. Um, we eat seals when we can, and we've resumed whale hunting just recently. Um, well, we resumed in 1999. We've been working with the government to uh, restart, and um, we will be again soon. So after about eight decades of not, <clears throat> of not whaling, speaking of whaling, due to the decline from unregulated non-macaw whaling, um, we did resume in 1999, and... Um, we now actually have, just as of two weeks ago, the draft environmental impact statement. Some of you are familiar with what EISs involve, and for us it's a 1,230-page document. It's up for public comment right now, um, with comments accepted, I believe, until early May. So anyway, whale, macaws and whale hunting are kind of resurfacing as a public issue. Of course, it's never gone away as far as how important it is to our, our people. So we know a lot of details about our pre-contact past, in part due to our isolation. Contact with non-Indians didn't happen for us until the 1780s, and there wasn't even a road until our reservation until 1931. So prior to 1931, all travel to and from Macaw territory was by canoe um, or by overland trail. So canoe, boats, steamships later on, or overland trails. So this isolation maintained an environment where Macaw people continued our traditional economic pursuits such as whaling, sealing, and fishing, well after the turn of the 20th century. Maintaining a traditional economy, albeit significantly changed by the commercial interests of non, of non macaws of settlers who came into the area. Um, and there was also commercial interest, of course, in whale oil, seal furs, and fish. This allowed our people to maintain um, traditions and ceremonies that aligned with resource harvests. It also encouraged reliance on traditional scientific and ecological knowledge. For example, just last week I was looking at a newspaper article from 1927 that described concern, and there was Coast Guard involvement, 
for a party of two canoes that had been out seal hunting. They're, they said there a heavy mist settled in, and so some folks got concerned. I don't know if it was just the Coast Guard that was concerned or if any macaws were concerned. So, but the macaw canoes arrived home safely, having gone out 30 or 40 miles in the ocean, and they brought in 26 seals. So you're talking 30 or 40 miles in the o open ocean, Pacific Ocean, with, um, with the ability to navigate, of course, well out of the sight of land, regardless of whether a heavy mist had settled in or not. Um, so that, that, that knowledge, that scientific knowledge, is very well documented, and of course that knowledge still exists today among some of our fishermen. Um, in early times, macaws lived in five traditional villages, <clears throat> or winter villages, moving to other areas in the spring, we call them campsites, to harvest the abundant resources and preserving um, food for winter use. Um, the southernmost of the five villages was called Ozette. Many of you have probably heard of Ozette. A large mudslide, possibly triggered by an earthquake, covered several houses sometime around 1700 or before. So again, a big mudslide covered several houses, didn't cover the whole village. Um, the exact date, though, of the mudslide is not known, but we do, do know that it was prior to contact. So the older layers there, of course, are, are pre-contact. People rebuilt houses on top of the <clears throat> mud after it had settled. Um, Macaw people always knew that that area was unstable since smaller mudslides weren't uncommon. They often would just flood the floor of a long, of a long house, though. But people still continued to live there um, because it really is considered prime real estate. You're um, in a village that's very much westward, so you're close to migrating whales and seals, and then you have a little bit of protection from some islands and reefs offshore, protection from the severe winter storms. Um, so oral histories, of course, have informed current generations of macaws about a big mudslide. Um, people stopped living at Ozette after the turn of the 20th century due to the government requirement that children over a certain age attend school and, and because of several other factors, too, involving a draw to Nia Bay. The location of the village certainly wasn't forgotten, and the rich resources drew macaws back to the area seasonally for fish, seals, and clams, and plus it was the ancestral home, of course, of a, quite a few number of macaw people. During the winter of 1969 and 1970, some severe winter storms exposed artifacts from the bank at Ozette. Um, complete artifacts, not just midden, were exposed. Paddles were sticking out of the bank. Um, a hiker actually called the tribal council and informed um, one of our tribal council members. He said, they're taking stuff from your house. And, um, he had to figure out what he meant, and what he, he came to realize was that it, it, you know, things were coming out of the bank at Ozette. Um, this, this council member was named Ed Coplanaho, and he was aware that Dr. Richard Doherty from Washington State University, where it, which actually is a college that he attended, our council, one of our council people, had done an archaeological survey on the coast. He was the one who had done a, a complete survey on the Washington coast of the sites, of the known sites. And um, so they got in touch with Dr. Doherty, expecting to do um, what, would be a, what it would have been considered a salvage excavation. Dr. Doherty said he went in that spring expecting to be completed by the fall of that year of 1970, and instead they ended up excavating for 11 years, uncovering 55,000 artifacts. Again, um, he was there at the request of the tribe. The village of Ozette, um, though not included in the treaty as a part of the reservation, was actually added to our reservation by executive order. So it was this um, very small part of our reservation, but separated from the main body. So the, the, the archaeologist um, and the, was asked to come in, Dr. Richard Doherty. So what, what turned into, that of course turned to an, into a great big project. Um, and in the very beginning phases, the Macaw tribe made it clear that the artifacts would be brought to Nia Bay, which is the main town on our reservation, and um, not to be removed to an off to a university or to <clears throat> a museum for any treatment or curation. So this meant that the graduate students that worked for Dr. Doherty had to develop um, techniques and often build their own equipment out of surplus <laughs> materials. Um, to stabilize the collection. They did the initial stabilization down at the site, at the Ozette site. And again, we're talking, I talked about Nia Bay being remote, but Ozette is incredibly remote. You have to go in by trail or by helicopter or by canoe. 
And um, so they did the initial stabilization there um, at the site. Um, and the tribe, of course, also, the tribal leaders also anticipated that there would be, that, that there could have been some lives that would, that would lost in the, in the sudden mudslide. So this mudslide came down at about 65 miles an hour. And right in the beginning, they stipulated that if, if that, were to, that were the case, that any ancestral remains would be buried right there on the site. And again, we're talking way prior to NAGPRA, of course. So typically, um, you know, this wasn't part of, wasn't always part of these big conversations like it is now. These Macaw leaders also knew what a unique opportunity it was to be part of this excavation, so they hired young Macaw people to work at the site as members of the field crew. Clearly, this was a historic event, and affording the experience to Macaw tribal members made perfect sense. They worked alongside the field school students who were university students, really from all over the country, uh, primarily from you know, the U.S., and beside the graduate students who ran the excavation under the direction of Dr. Doherty. Um, these Macaw students not taught the non-Macaw students how to dig clams at low tide and how to prepare them, how to play traditional gambling games. They'd even bring the Ozette crew up to Nia Bay um, to play against the Macaws there on the reservation. They described to them the connections they had to the artifacts that they were all excavating, which helped the field school students understand that they were part of an important heritage project, not just excavating artifacts from a distant past. Um, the Tribal Council and Dr. Doherty, we refer to him as Doc, um, were able to arrange the Army Corps and Marine Corps helicopters to actually provide um, assistance bringing the artifacts out at Ozette. So after they were initially stabilized, the Corps would transport the artifacts to the lab in Nia Bay. Um, again, no road to Ozette, and this was the most efficient way to move the artifacts. And it also satisfied a training requirement that the, that the Corps had. So it met their needs and it met our needs. Um, Macaw elders were sometimes flown in to the excavation site. Um, young Macaws listened intently when Macaw elders were there. The elders helped identify the artifacts that were being removed from the mud and they described how they were made and how they were used. They indicated where the materials would have been gathered from and where Ozet villagers would have been hunting and fishing. These young Macaws that were in this, involved in this excavation were really learning at an accelerated pace. They absorbed information rapidly that they might have learned over a longer period of time. I want to make sure that I'm not um, saying that, that this excavation sort of saved or it, you know, created interest that wouldn't have been there in macaw culture or, and particularly in material culture. What I really do think is it allowed people to learn a lot in a very condensed period of time. So the, a lot of these young macaw excavators have since then assumed roles of responsibility among the tribe. Some, many have served on the tribal council, have served on the Macaw Cultural, Cultural and Research Center Board of Trustees, um, some work at the MCRC, others are song leaders, and most really have a sincere appreciation for Macaw history and cultural values. So it really was an interesting time and certainly had a lot of impact. Um, just a few years into the excavation, the Macaw tribe decided that in order to share the Ozette collection with the rest of the world, and in order to centralize the cultural education projects that had sprung up on reservations, some of you may know about the Johnson O'Malley education programs and funding that, that had um, emerged, that it would be important to create a museum or a cultural center. The tribe began planning and fundraising. Um, an architect was selected from a Seattle firm and then an exhibit designer was brought in from Canada. We chose Jean-Jacques André, who was then at the what was called the Provincial Museum in British Columbia in Victoria. Now it's called the Royal BC Museum. Um, so he was selected as the exhibit designer. Um, he was to work with a team of Macaw people to come up with a storyline and then begin planning the exhibits. He and this team of Macaws went down to Ozette for a retreat so they could immerse themselves in that environment that created those, that created those artifacts. Um, the team decided that they would bring the visitor through the different seasonal activities starting with spring. So when you first come into our museum, you're looking at what, what occurs during the spring. Starts with whale hunting. Whale, whale hunting is a spring and a fall activity. They brought their concept back to the tribal council <clears throat> and asked to be allowed to design the exhibits first and then to have the building wrap around the exhibits. 
the council agreed, even though this meant tossing the original plans for the building as the architect had actually already drawn them up. Um, the architect, Fred Bassetti, who was from Seattle, said he still really wanted to be involved in the project, wanted to continue, and, and agreed to actually um, absorb those costs of those initial plans and, and worked with us in that next phase. He sat down with Macaw Elders, and um, so because our museum, our center is um, maybe more than 24,000 square feet, uh, and which is much bigger than a longhouse, it's about 30 by 60 feet, um, they, they did agree, though, to have at least a reflection of traditional architecture. And so it's a, it's a, the exterior looks like lap, lap cedar planks, which is, of course, what longhouses are uh, made out of. And the exhibits themselves teach the visitors what life was like for Macaws at Ozette several centuries ago. The mudslide perfectly preserved numerous tools that are displayed alongside illustrations and photographs. Very, there's a few replicas involved, but primarily we're looking at original artifacts that are you know, roughly 500 years old. The labels are minimal and have only been changed more recently to include Macaw language. Even with this addition, it's our intent, of course, to have the labels not overwhelm the objects. This is what they decided in the beginning, and this is what we've actually um, adhered, continued to adhere to. The text inside the cases is primarily in first person, um, a very knowledgeable and talented Macaw writer is quoted throughout the exhibit text, uh, though some of the text is actually in the third person. But the intent is to have a Macaw voice telling the story. Um, the Board of Trustees was initially selected by the community, and it's an all Macaw board. All of our board members, all of our 12 board members are Macaw. And they provide poli policy direction and oversee adherence to our mission. Um, the board reviews research proposals and approves or des denies them depending on the potential benefit or harm to the tribe, um, among other considerations. The board is also involved in fundraising, planning, and budgeting. The 12-member board includes members of most of the bigger families among our tribe, although there is no official policy that requires this. But this diversity helps foster this broad notion of community ownership. Uh, prior to the 1979 opening of the Macaw Cultural and Research Center, the Macaw tribe officially designated the Macaw language the official language of the Macaw Indian tribe and formed uh, the Macaw language program, which is within the MCRC. The bulk of our efforts, actually, for the past 35 years have been focused on revitalizing Macaw language. We have documented and analyzed the language, developed curriculum, and taught classes, but we have yet to even publish a dictionary. Well, we realized that publication of a dictionary would draw recognition and demonstrate our capacity, we continue to focus on teaching language to preschool children, school children, and to adults. So our primary goal is to restore our language to spoken fluency. Um, with some administration for Native American grant funding, we spent several years, this is back in the mid-90s, on a mentor-apprentice language project to make sure that we learned all that we could from our older Macaw speakers. Um, and it was, a, it was a wise decision, actually. We don't have anybody left now that's a, that's a firstborn speaker, mother tongue speaker. And then we began revising curriculum for elementary school and for high school students. At our initial meetings with the elementary school administrators, they expressed concerns saying that they had some children in the school that had difficulty reading. And, and we we've used an adaptation of the International Phonetic Alphabet, actually, since 1978 and they didn't want us to confuse the children and make things more difficult for them. We explained to them that you know, research indicates that children learning two languages actually do better academically and just, just trust us and let us, let us at them. We, um, we started off by doing 20-minute um, lessons, and earlier they had done classes in the elementary school. This wasn't the first time in the 90s, but it was after the passage of the Native American Languages Act, and um, we were sort of re re-energized about teaching, learning and teaching, you know, increasing the skills of our teachers and then of course teaching younger students. Um, so in those initial classes looked at 20 minute slots and from the mid 90s till now we actually have almost two hours a week with the kids. And again, this is a public school. Nia Bay is um, a reservation. Most of our land is actually tribally owned or owned by 
um, macaw individuals as, through allotments or assignments. And very little land is fee land, but we do have a little pocket of fee land in the middle of the town where we have a school. So we have a state school and a reservation. And so um, it's part of another district, which actually doesn't, the non-Indian town, just, just our, our neighboring town is also part of our district. So anyway, we, were conv we convinced them to give us more and more time. And um, the student, our, our teachers now are actually certified. We have a process um, through Washington State called a First Peoples Language and Culture Teaching Certificate. And among our tribe, we actually have the most certified teachers of anybody else in the state. We have eight language teachers. They're not all working with us in our language program right now. And we have two on deck that, to be certified soon. Um, so we're really proud of that. Um, so as I mentioned, our, our initial time slots were about 20 minutes. We've moved now to just under two hours with the kids. Um, so they're doing two almost one hour classes per week with our language teachers. And so and interestingly, as the children received more language instruction, their overall test scores began to rise. And now our elementary school has received more awards than I can even keep track of. We don't believe this correlation between language lessons and improved test scores is a coincidence. In fact, our tribal council is convinced it's very much connected. Um, also, since 2011, the Neobay High School graduation classes have basically been producing graduates who are all attending two-year universities, four-year universities, trade schools, um, or the military. Basically, 100% of our graduates have a plan and are doing something after they graduate. And we have a graduation rate that I believe is above 85%. So we're one of those high-performing schools, very remote community, um, very small school, but um, pretty high-performing. We're really proud of that. So when Brian mentioned that I'm on the Higher Education Committee, that creates a problem because we have so many students in college, we're having to constantly campaign, lobby the Tribal Council for more funding so we can help meet their unmet needs. But it's a good problem. It's a good problem to have. Um, and so we're really, we're really proud of how well the students are doing academically. And again, we're seeing a, a connection with um, with the language. Um, another area where we've developed a unique approach is how we manage our collections. Um, I mentioned we have 55,000 artifacts that we excavated from Ozette. We also have an ethnographic collection that's, that's, that's growing all the time. When people understand that we have an 8,100 square foot storage facility with environmental controls and then of course all these other interesting things going on, we often get um, donations of primarily basketry or carvings um, so we do have other than the um, pre-contact artifacts, but that's still the bulk of our collection, of course. Um, so we have a system, a collections management system, that attempts to preserve rather than erode cultural values. Um, we started off before we moved the collection into the building in the early 90s, at least doing bilingual labels. We thought we have language learners in here, we need to support their efforts and at least have bilingual labels so that they can relate to the pieces in, um, in the language. And then we had a group that we were ready to move over called containers that we were looking at and then we realized we're just calling these containers in English but we don't, we don't even, all of, we didn't have all the names, we didn't have that whole section bilingually labeled. And we got together with our language staff. This is when I was working in collections before 95, before I was the director. Um, and realized that, let's take a look at these, at, the, at what, that these names of these containers, and are they called containers in language? What are they? How do, you know? So when we look at the roots and the suffix, many of them were actually called containers. The baskets had an uts and a suts ending. The bowls, the wooden bowls, were containers for oil, at suts, so con oil container for. And then the bentwood boxes that we were grouping as containers, we realized aren't containers. Their name and the language is altogether different. It describes the tech the more of the technology, the curfing, the 90 degree corners, and those are, um, the name doesn't have uts or sats, it's hachwiduks, it's just a different, um, different word altogether. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's do this in a way that really makes sense to us at Macaw. And so we um, then looked around and thought, okay, we, we have a grouping, a small grouping of containers, which doesn't include the Bentwood boxes. And they're, they're, some of them are half this size, some of them are big, many of them are smaller for cooking, they're watertight. Um, but what else might be called a container? Is there anything else that we're not thinking of in a container using this English lens? 
and we found that there was, and one of them is a um, container for people, which is um, chaputs, which is a generic word for canoe. So canoes and baskets and bowls have a relationship to each other that we didn't know about before, before we started using macaw in the, in the way that we organized the collection. And then, um, you know, we made mistakes on calling other things containers. So it really is a unique way that we do that. We also are paying attention to traditional concepts of ownership. So even though I said we have 55,000 artifacts, that's not all complete artifacts. Some of them, of course, are fragments. And so we, might, we would have um, broken pieces of, um, you know, canoe paddles are a good example because, well, um, and rather than store them just by size, we store them by house because in a long house, you would have had members of an extended family um, who would have shared, you know, a lot of the property. And so we won't just store things by size, but we store them according to what house they were excavated from. So house one canoe paddle fragments would be stored together and house two fragments stored together rather than just the small pieces and then the, the big pieces. Um, and then we also apply handling restrictions, gender restrictions. Um, and we're always doing more research to figure out what gender restri restrictions should be applied. We, um, for example, don't have women handling whaling gear. Women of at least of a certain age weren't to handle whaling gear. Women did play a real important role in a whale hunt, but it didn't necessarily involve handling the gear. And since that system was in place, that value system was in place when these objects were made, we, we continue to adhere to that, even for, for non macaw So non macaw researchers have act, ha, asked to have access, and they've been denied, actually. So we do manage the collection in a way that makes sense to us. And it's simpler than a lot of places, because we're looking just at our culture group. We're not, we're not grouped with anybody else. And so it does, it does make things much simpler. Um, so as you might expect, our archival and library department focuses on publications, documents, recording, map, recordings, maps, and photos related to Macaw history and the history, of Nia Bay, history and culture of Nia Bay. We also collect information related to neighboring tribes, as some collections can even have brief but important information related to Macaw. Um, also in our efforts to protect our treaty harvest areas and quotas, which have been adjudicated by the courts, it makes sense to know what our immediate neighbors have been utilizing and, what lo and in what locations over time. Um, <clears throat> well, a more academic anthropological approach would be concerned with gathering information about resource harvesting, type quantities, locations, land and water, areas of occupation, looking at villages and seasonal camps, ceremonies, place names and genealogy, etc. We also concern ourselves with the collection of this information, but with the overarching concern that this information may be helpful in defense of our treaty rights. For example, a recording or affidavit of an elder describing where they customarily fished for specific species of bottom fish may be interesting to his descendants or to a <clears throat> project focusing on traditional navigation techniques, but it may also have um, been helpful by the tribes in the tribe's efforts to define our treaty fishing area, which has actually been adjudicated at 40 miles offshore. So the resources that we have that we collect um, really have so much importance, and the way that the board reviews the research proposals, of course, while you can't always anticipate the outcome of the research, can't anticipate the results. We, we do the best that we can do, and we certainly wouldn't participate in projects that might have negative impact on us and our treaty rights. Um, access to sensitive archival materials, of course, is carefully regulated. Sensitive materials are not only those documents that describe ceremonial sites, rituals, or burial areas, but can also um, be documents that may cause confusion regarding the protection or exercise of treaty rights. While we are proud of the gains we have made in our organization and physical storage of our archival collection, and we have everything digitized these days, um, we have a massive amount of work to accomplish in creating access to these collections. Many recordings have not yet been transcribed, so until they are indexed, transcribed, and reviewed, they are not available to anyone. So many oral history projects focus on gathering um, gathering, but not necessarily allowing for the transcription, the time-consuming 
process of transcription. So it's a, it's a real challenge of ours. I said I wouldn't talk about too many challenges, but we have information, so we know we have your grandfather's recordings, but we can't let you access them even because they haven't been reviewed. It's very difficult, but it's, it's what we're working towards, so we will, we will get there. Um, we do engage, of course, in collaborative research project when the process and outcome are potentially beneficial to our tribe, though we realize, of course, that we can't always anticipate um, that before the research is conducted. We have an ongoing paleo shoreline study, for example, where we try to determine earlier locations of shorelines in order, in order to understand where to look for cultural resources. Collaboration with um, the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, which is within NOAA, um, allowed us to do a test excavation in a timber stand of shell midden that's at about 40 feet above current sea level and about a mile off of the current shoreline. Um, <clears throat> up to that point, the sanctuary, the, the, the federal sanctuary, didn't necessarily understand the importance of conducting research on land well, out about, well outside of the boundaries of the sanctuary, but we helped them understand how looking at earlier shorelines that are now elevated could help them also understand what to anticipate in submerged shorelines. Um, other collaboration, but not research-based per se, um, we, we do with the Sanctuary of the Summer Interpretive Program, started in 2008. So this marine sanctuary, which borders our reservation, and we share, we co-manage the waters, um, allows us to, do in, to provide summer interpretive services. Lots of people come to Nia Bay in the summer. It's just beautiful. And again, we're at the very northwest tip, and we have a wonderful museum and beautiful hiking trails and beautiful beaches. And so we have all a group of Macaw interpreters that are out dealing with the public, describing you know, what they're looking at as far as the sea mammals and the birds and you know, answer lots of just general questions about the reservation as well. So that's a nice collaborative program. Again, they provide the funding, but we run the, we run the whole show and, and all our guides, of course, are Macaw. Currently, we're working with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, another federal agency, on a tribal cultural landscapes project. Um, Bone, Bohm has partnered with three tribes. So we're the tribe in Washington State, the Grand Ronde in Oregon, and the Yurok tribe in California. Um, so we're characterizing a, tribe, a cultural landscape, a tribal cultural landscape, whose ex area is expected to cover the, shore, the coast as well as offshore. Um, and it's minimally to include 6,000 square acres, but we've gone way beyond, we've, way beyond that with ours because our fisheries folks um, convince us to go actually all the way out 40 miles to the edge of our, edge of our UNA. Um, the interesting thing, of course, about this landscape approach, it allows us to describe the interconnection of the resources that are currently important, historically important, and important during the pre-contact period as well. <clears throat> so a migration path of gray and humpback whales, for example, can be connected to the stars and triangulated mountain peaks, which would be used for offshore navigation, and connected to a prairie inland where elk graze, elk antlers were used exclusively in whale hunting gear. Again, that's actually preserved still in the grounded ozette. So we did a big excavation, but we didn't excavate everything. Um, so we're looking at resources, you know, offshore, coastal, inland, from 500 years ago and then still connected to us today. So it's, it's really a lot better than a map with a bunch of dots of archeological sites, um, this landscape approach. So this is unique because it essentially allows us to be proactive um, regarding cultural resource management. So right now there's not any application to do research or development um, in our ocean area, but we do know that sustainable energy projects are only gonna be more important and um, this, this will allow us to react um, in a more organized fashion when those, when those actually do come our way again. So we're really excited about this project. And um, interesting thing about this project is, well, one of the ways that makes it easy to do this is the federal funding went through a, um, a foundation and then the contract came to our tribe. And we were very clear in that contract that the raw, data gener the raw data that is generated is actually um, to be managed and controlled by us, that it's not considered a deliverable. Um, we're describing how we're conducting this, this, land, this project, how we're going about doing the research, but we're not including, we're not requiring ourselves to include that data. And we were very careful in how we reviewed that language in the contract. Um, so that's kind of unique because I think a lot of tribes have concerns 
or at least some do, when federal funding is attached, whether, they, whether through FOIA, do, they, do you have access to everything? We've understood, though, that the correspondence and the reports are something that are accessible to the public, but not always all the content, even if it was direct federal funding. So we're really um, enjoying working with these other tribes and these, this agency on this project. We've never done anything with Bureau of Ocean Energy Management before. Um, let me see, another research project that we didn't initiate, but we're very enthusiastic, that we were very enthusiastic about participating in is the dissertation research of a um, man named Joshua Reed, who was a graduate student from UC Davis. Um, he approached our board of trustees with a research request to access the MCRC collections um, and to conduct, conduct interviews on the Macaw Reservation. Um, anything that would involve access to the collections that may result in publication, of course, would have to be, go, would be reviewed by the Board of Trustees. His project was, his study was called The Sea is My Country, the, Marine, the Maritime World of the Macaw and Indigenous Borderlands People. So Josh Reed compiled accounts of Macaw management, control, and use of Macaw marine space over the last several hundred years, <clears throat> and the end result is groundbreaking. Never before has a historian examined the way that a tribe, specifically in this case, the, Mac the Macaw tribe, um, manage access to and controlled resource extraction from the ocean. Numerous scholars, of course, have looked at the importance of land and terrestrial landscapes, but really nobody to date has done this type of work. We think it's absolutely fascinating and incredibly important contribution to scholarship, but even more importantly, <clears throat> um, it's a record of our maritime history that we as macaws all knew bits and pieces of, but the way he has compiled it makes it such a useful teaching tool for um, our young tribal members. Um, when Josh, who's actually a Native, Native American himself, he's a member of the um, Snohomish tribe in Washington state, um, was asked a question at the, a community presentation when he was um, talking about his research if any of this material could be developed into curriculum for our school kids, he's, at, he's, he's obliged. So in this upcoming year, he'll be working on, with our school district to develop curriculum and work with teachers on the Nia Bay campus. Um, and his book is to be published, actually, I think this, this summer, coming very soon. So we're really, um, we we're very excited to work with him. And again, we're, we're expecting that this um, is going to be just a really useful um, compilation. So by describing the unique work that our tribe does in relation to preserving and interpreting our culture and history, revitalizing our language and managing our collections, collaborating with federal agencies, private foundations, and universities, I'm attempting to illustrate how our calculated selection of partnerships works to further our own tribe's goals. We realize that our research interests sometimes intersect with those of others, and when they do, we are wise to move forward collaboratively. A small tribe like ours has to be resourceful. We have a long history of protecting our unique way of life, and we also have a long history of understanding where the strengths of others can be captured to make our lives richer. We've created and negotiated relationships with outsiders that we maintain for decades, and those relationships continue to reap benefits. For example, next week when I return back to Nia Bay, we're hosting a book signing for an author who wrote a book titled Ozette, The Excavation of a Macaw Whaling Village. The author's name is Ruth Kirk, she's a very well-known photographer also, and um, began her involvement with the Ozette site actually early in the 1970s. Um, she's written other, another book about Ozette called The Hunters of the Whale, as well as numerous other books about the Northwest Coast and Washington archaeology. Um, she's also produced a film about the Ozette project. This recent book not only describes the findings of Ozette for lay people, I mean, so it's a compilation of all these archaeological reports and it puts it into terms that everybody can enjoy and understand, but it also tells the story of the excavation with wonderful description of the involvement of Macaw elders and young excavators, really great photographs. We've maintained a friendship with Ruth Kirk for roughly 45 years and also continued our relationship with Dr. Doherty, who I talked about, the archaeologist, right up until the end of his life. He was alive until just a couple of years ago. And Ruth and Doc actually married each other when they were both in their 80s on our reservation. <laughs> yeah, you just never know. 
The introduction of Ruth's book is written by a Macaw woman who's actually the president of our board of trustees and one of the young Macaw excavators who spent years excavated at Ozette. I think she actually excavated there the longest out of any of the young, out of any of the young Macaws. Um, so as Macaws, we've always been able to com communicate <clears throat> what is important to us. Prior to our treaty negotiations in 1855, a number of our very strong leaders were killed by a smallpox epidemic. In the 1850s, a horrible epidemic came through and killed uh, well over 50%, up, upwards of almost three quarters of our population. And the territory governor, whose name was Isaac Stevens, was very much looking forward to, to um, negotiating with the Macaws in what he, would, he described as a weakened state. Um, he... Um, but even our newer leaders, um, our younger leaders, were able to communicate what our tribe needed in order to continue, to continue our way of life. They all expressed the need to have the ocean and just a little bit of land where the houses were. That we have been challenged for decades and resources, resources of course, have been over har harvested and poorly managed after non-Indians arrived in our waters. We essentially have maintained access to the ocean and the important resources and our key players in protecting habitat and managing quotas. Um, potlatches are a very old macaw tradition, also held by other folks in the Northwest Coast. I realized one day um, that there's a connection between how contemporary macaw people carry themselves and how potlatch hosts communicated in the past. Potlatches were not just about the redistribution of goods or even about giving things away and feeding people in order to maintain status. They're also a platform for a host to say what is his or hers in regard to names, songs, productive fishing banks, and the like. You describe what is yours, what you have the rights to in front of witnesses. Macaws may seem bold and even arrogant to some, but in reality, it's just traditional behavior. For countless generations, we have been telling our own story, negotiating for the long-term benefit of the tribe and partnering with skilled outsiders to make our, futures, our future more secure. Much of our focus has been inward, as I have described, but we take great pride in being able to share our story with others. Having a beautifully preserved collection that allows us to illustrate our history gives us this wonderful opportunity. Thousands of people a year are given a chance to learn about pre-contact macaw life. Those who take full advantage of what we offer can leave with an improved understanding of technology, of architecture, resource harvest, ceremonies, language art, and so much more. Thank you.